Turkey and Iran plan to join forces against al-Qaeda-affiliated groups, following rare talks in Ankara about cooperation in Syria. I'm Matthew Moore, and today's newsmaker is the relationship between Turkey and Iran. Iran's defense chief hasn't visited Ankara since 1979, but that all changed when an Iranian delegation arrived last week. The result? Well, long-time rivals turned into strange bedfellows in the Syrian war. While Turkey backs the opposition and Iran supports Syria's Bashar al-Assad, they agreed to a so-called de-escalation zone in northern Idlib. The deal benefits both sides. Turkey wants to drive back fighters it considers terrorists. Meanwhile, Iran hopes to get an advantage over rebels with ties to al-Qaeda. It's an interesting situation, but how long will it last? Ankara called it a milestone. Tehran described it as unprecedented. A three-day trip by the Iranian chief of staff to the Turkish presidential complex. The talks were the first of their kind since the Iranian revolution of 1979. So what's changed? Well, the blockade against Qatar in June by four Arab countries may have been a factor. The Saudi-led siege brought Tehran and Ankara closer when both sides backed Doha in the dispute. To get around the blockade, Ankara is flying in tons of food every day to the Gulf state and has just agreed to supply even more by going overland through Iran. And then there's the war in Syria. While General Mohammed Bakari was in Turkey, he also met his military counterpart to talk tactics. Another significant sign that the countries are prepared to walk side by side, given that Ankara wants Syria's Bashar al-Assad gone, while Tehran thinks he should stay. But now both nations have a common enemy in Idlib, where a group of al-Qaeda-linked fighters have gained control. There's also the Kurdish connection, since both countries host a sizable population. The meeting in Ankara focused on the fight against the PKK terror group in Turkey, as well as its Iranian offshoot. And plans by leaders of the Kurdish regional government to hold an independence referendum on September 25th also have Tehran and Ankara nervous about further political destabilization. God forbid, it could even lead to a civil war. This is serious. We have clearly told them we are against this referendum and they shouldn't hold it. We will continue to say that. Finally, there is the economic bond. Around $14 billion worth of trade goes between the two countries every year and that's soon expected to double. Iran also just signed a deal to become Turkey's second biggest gas supplier after Russia, promising enough of the natural resource to last 150 years. And with President Erdogan planning to visit Tehran in September, it seems like their relationship is only growing stronger. Vanessa Keneally, The Newsmakers. Well, let's go to our panel now. Joining me in the studio is Tala Koze. He is an Associate Professor of Political Science at Ibn Khaldun University. From Marbella in Spain is the former Iranian diplomat, Merdad Khonsari. And from Washington, D.C., Ahmad Madija. He is a senior fellow at the Iran Observed Project at the Middle East Institute. Ahmed Ad Kansari, if I could start with you. Why do you think this high-level delegation came to Ankara now? Things between Iran and Turkey have improved dramatically over the last several months since uh, President Erdogan took a different position regarding uh, the outcome for the Syrian regime to which whose destiny and fate was a very sensitive issue for the Iranian regime. Uh, differences over Syria had cast a great deal of difference between Iran and Turkey. That has now been eliminated in uh, areas uh, to be explored for further cooperation have opened up and in, as a result of what has been happening in Qatar, what has been happening uh, 
in the region in general, you know, uh, I think that the situation has never been more ripe for uh, Iran and, uh, uh, and uh, Turkey to come together, in particular in advance of the forthcoming uh, referendum that is scheduled yes. to be held on the 1st of October. And that is, of course, some an, an area and an issue over which Iranian and Turkish sensitivities and concerns coincide. Merdad, I think you've essentially set out the entire agenda for this debate. Let us start with the first issue that you mentioned, the change in approach with regards to Bashar al-Assad. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, uh, the uh, Turkish president was quite vocal and vehement in his opposition uh, that to Mr. Assad and to the fact that his regime had to go. But uh, the situation on the ground uh, having changed in favor of Assad, especially after uh, Russia's entry into the equation and the spat of differences that occurred between Turkey and Russia, for which uh, the Turkish president was anxious to repair those, uh, those uh, differences, has led to a situation where uh, he came out with a new position that in essence, right. uh, accepted the uh, Assad regime remaining in power, me, which brought it, obviously, closer to Iran. Let me just bring in our studio guest, Tala Kozey, just from the Turkish side. Mm -hmm. Do you, would you go as far as saying that uh, President Erdogan and the Turkish government have accepted that eventuality? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, uh, yes, I mean, certain things have changed uh, on the field. And, uh, but this is related to uh, the changing position of the U.S., changing position of Europe, and changing position of the other countries that were also supporting the opposition. So for the moment, uh, U.S. and European position and uh, the Gulf position with regard to the uh, Syrian opposition changed drastically. So uh, U.S. insisted on uh, supporting and arming the PKK, PYD in Syria, and their position is expanding in the uh, Iraq as well. So Turkey has serious security concerns, and uh, I think it was very difficult to maintain this position. So yes, uh, Russian involvement in Syrian crisis changed the situation, but the second issue for Turkey was U.S. insistence on supporting the uh, PKK and PYD and increasing the region that's controlled by the uh, mm. PKK PYD. So okay. Turkey's security concerns are not taken seriously. We're, we're going to come back mm. to that issue in a moment. First of all, let me bring in Ahmed Majedia in Washington. Why do you think, what is the most important reason for this uh, coming together now? Well, I partly agree with your first speaker that the latest steps uh, taken by Iran and Turkey to improve their relations and find a common ground to cooperate more on uh, regional issues of mutual concern should be seen within the changed uh, regional dynamics uh, because Turkey and Iran, they have had divergent policies in Iraq and they've been on opposite sides of the uh, Syrian civil war. Uh, but from Iran's perspective, now they see themselves as winner because the Assad regime is now in control of all the population centers, and Turkey-backed uh, groups, uh, they, are, they have lost territory. And as we see that uh, the ISIS is uh, on the brink of defeat in Iraq and also losing ground in Syria, uh, it is Iran and its proxies that are filling that power vacuum. Uh, so Turkey has, uh, wants to now, uh, so Iran also wants to de-escalate tension with Turkey to sustain and consolidate its gains. But from Turkey's perspective, uh, it also has the international uh, uh, context as well, because uh, President Erdogan has been disappointed by the Trump administration's refusal to uh, halt its support for some of the Kurdish forces in northern Syria, uh, and also take a more aggressive action against Iranian uh, Shiite proxies and, uh, in Syria and Iraq. So that's why it, it now wants okay. to seek more cooperation with Russia and Iran to address some of its let's, security uh, and political concerns in the let's region. Let's highlight some of the, the key reasons why the two countries are coming a little closer together. Merdad, you did mention the referendum that the Kurdish regional government in Iraq wants to hold on independence being one of the key reasons why Turkey and Iran are looking to cooperate. Just tell us why both countries fear that. Well, of course, both Iran and Turkey have a large Kurdish population, and 
uh, any change in the status of the Kurds in Iraq were it to lead to independence would inevitably have a knock-on effect as far as the Kurdish population in both Iran, uh, Syria and uh, Turkey uh, would be concerned. And so naturally, both Iran and Turkey share this common interest of wanting to uh, remain, uh, wanting the Kurdish uh, elements in Iraq to remain within uh, Iraqi unitary state, albeit under a federal constitution, but oppose the idea of an independent Kurdistan, which could jeopardize the security of their internal security of their own countries. And obviously, this is a follow-on to the kind of concerns that other speakers uh, spoke about regarding U.S. and Western support for Kurdish elements in Syria, who Turkey perceives as a long-term threat to its own right. security were they to be successful in the campaign that they're conducting at this time. And now we heard President Erdogan talking today about the possibility of a joint mm -hmm. operation. Uh, let's have a listen to what he had to say. As you know, the PKK terrorist organization has an Iranian arm called PJAK, and these two groups have constantly caused harm to both Turkey and Iran. If our two countries stand together in solidarity, these threats would come to an end in a very short time. So tell us, the Turkish president talking about the possibility of joint military action. What do you think about that? So both countries see uh, expansion of PK, PKK and PYD in the region as a security threat. So both countries actually agreed on the fact that they want to maintain unity of Iraq and Syria. But Turkey wanted a little bit more inclusive uh, regime. But at this moment, uh, as uh, the fight against uh, Daesh has been used uh, as some kind of pretext to expand the control of PKK, P PYD, and both Turkey and uh, Iran are concerned that the emerging uh, stripe uh, in uh, Iraq and uh, Syria may be a long-term security challenge, long-term security problem. And this region is uh, armed heavily by the U.S. So Iran is concerned that these weapons may be used in the future against Iran because Trump administration have some uh, in different views in comparison to uh, Obama administration with regard to the Iranian issue. And Turkey is also concerned that uh, there, uh, a new uh, political entity is emerging in Turkey's uh, southern territories that is disconnecting from the uh, Arab Middle East. So both countries have uh, shared concerns and the, the, the issue is that uh, the PYD, PKK is heavily armed and in the future this uh, Barzani-controlled area may be united with this emerging uh, political entity, and it may create further political problem. Do, do you think that Iran would like to move closer to Turkey, if only to ask Ankara to use its influence in northern Iraq to prevent that referendum going ahead? I think uh, it, it may be very difficult to uh, control the situation if uh, the KRG uh, uh, can, uh, you know, go through a process of uh, independence. So neither Iran nor uh, Turkey may be unable to control the future of the uh, political developments because this may further increase the uh, civil war in uh, Iraq and it may turn into a uh, Arab-Kurdish conflict and it may unite other Kurdish entities together against both Turkey and Iran. So it may create counter alliances and it may be out of control. You mentioned the Trump administration. Let's jump back to Washington now and Ahmed Majidia. Tell me, do you think the Iranians now see Trump as so unreliable, so unpredictable when it comes to the Iranian nuclear deal that they now start to look towards Turkey to insulate themselves against possible further sanctions coming out of Washington? Yeah, you're absolutely right, because that's one of, uh, one of the key factors that Iran is uh, trying to cultivate closer ties with Turkey. Uh, when, during the election campaign here in the United States, uh, uh, Iranian leaders were very optimistic uh, about President Trump. Although they were very cautious about it, they thought that 
uh, Trump was a businessman and could just uh, deal with Russia and uh, ultimately with Iran as well in Syria. But we saw that uh, President Trump um, uh, did quite the opposite. It, incre it has increased the sanctions on Iran and even uh, is threatening to uh, canceling the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, so Iran uh, wants to preempt that, uh, that move and is uh, trying to cultivate closer relations with regional countries, including Ankara, uh, not just in the political and security front, but also economic ties in order to minimize the impact of any uh, economic sanctions by the United States. Mehdad Kansari, what is your take on the, the U.S. administration's influence on this situation? Do you think they are somehow driving both Turkey and Iran closer together? Well, I think they are. They have inadvertently driven Turkey and Iran closer together. But you have to bear in mind that when it comes to the Kurdish referendum and the prospect of an independent Kurdish state, the United States official policy is on the side of both Iran and Turkey. So there is total agreement with the United States, with the United States in the sense that no party wants uh, an independent Kurdish state within Iraq. So uh, that particular part of it uh, shows the closeness of positions. And of course, uh, you have to bear in mind that the war against ISIS, in which Iran has been a party and Turkey has been a party, is again another uh, point of convergence with the United States, both in Iraq and Syria. So the situation is a little bit more complicated. And uh, we have not yet seen the kind of uh, uh, teeth that uh, uh, President Trump had, has sort of uh, shown the effects of that in a real sense against Iran. Though there's Mehdi. been much rhetoric and, uh, you know, lifting, you know, up upgrading of sanctions, which doesn't have that much effect. Mehdi, you were a diplomat with Iran uh, for many years and many years ago, and you were an expert on the country's relations in the Gulf. Let's take us to perhaps our last issue of this debate, and that is the situation with Qatar and its neighbors. To what extent is that driving Iran and Turkey closer together? And did you expect the two to come out on Qatar's side against Saudi Arabia and the others? You know, again, this was a more difficult uh, decision for Turkey to take than for Iran because Iran was on the opposite side of the equation so long as the GCC countries, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and all the others were united in their positions. And, you know, the uh, flagging up of this Shia-Sunni divide over the years had exacerbated that. But, and Turkey was, of course, trying to uh, cultivate its ties with both Saudi Arabia and Qatar, but mainly with Qatar. So, the surprise factor was the position in which Turkey took vis-a-vis -vis Qatar in respect to Saudi Arabia. And of course, uh, Qatar, by becoming isolated from Saudi Arabia, who is leading the regional charge against Iran, again, essentially forced Iran to come out openly in support of Qatar and bring its position closer to Turkey. This happened inadvertently. I don't believe that this was a calculated move. but. On the other hand, it does serve to bring both Turkey and Iran closer together on okay. this issue and forge closer cooperation on other issues as a result of this. Atar Koze, we've heard recently that Turkey is considering using a land route via Iran into Qatar in order to supply mm -hmm. uh, the country which is, has found itself isolated by Saudi Arabia and others. Can you just explain to our, uh, our viewers why uh, Turkey which has a very close relationship with Saudi Arabia, is helping Qatar, which is also being aided by Iran. Yeah. I think uh, the objective of this last initiative that was led by Saudi Arabia and UAE is to create a, some kind of bipolar system uh, within the, the Gulf and in the Middle East. So Iran is already in one side of the story, uh, one side of the pole, and uh, Turkey and Qatar used to play in between. So have, Turkey was trying to have good relations with Saudi Arabia and Iran as well, at least have some balanced relationship. And uh, Qatar was at the same time playing the similar role. And Actually, uh, Oman and Kuwait were also in the similar position. So with that last move, they wanted to polarize and push Turkey at least outside of this game 
or at least be part of uh, this uh, Sunni organized uh, poll. So Turkey's uh, successful diplomacy in the Qatar crisis uh, kept this polarization. At least Turkey maintained its position. It didn't necessarily get into further escalation with uh, Saudi Arabia and maintained its relation uh, with Iran and maintained uh, actually uh, autonomy of the Qatar. So that was very important for Turkey. Turkey really did, uh, don't like to the emergence of such a bipolar uh, sectarian oriented uh, system uh, in the uh, Middle East. And also this kind of uh, Turkey also considered that this is not an internal driven thing. So uh, some people from the Trump administration also encouraged emergence of a, such a system in the region. So keeping that kind of balance and increasing the influence of the regional actors, including Saudi Arabia and Iran, was major concern for Turkey. Talakose, Ahmed Majidia and Merdad Konsari in Marbella. Thank you all so much for joining us on Newsmakers. Coming up in the program is the United States unwittingly arming Hezbollah in Lebanon. And the forgotten refugee crisis. More than a million people have fled to Uganda. Lebanon and Syria say they're not coordinating with each other, but the two countries have announced simultaneous operations to fight Daesh along their shared border. It might come as a sigh of relief to nearby towns and villages, which for years have faced waves of attacks and kidnappings. But some, especially supporters of Israel, say the move is risky. They believe it may give the Lebanese group Hezbollah a chance to get their hands on US-made weapons. Advanced U.S. weaponry is transforming Lebanon's armed forces and empowering a vital ally in the Middle East. The most recent arrivals are these eight Bradley fighting vehicles, which will eventually number a total of 32. They alone represent a $100 million investment. But that's just a small sample of the more than $1.4 billion worth of military equipment and training the U.S. has given Lebanon since 2006. Washington's been trying to tilt the balance of military power in the country away from Iran-backed Hezbollah, which it considers a terrorist organization. Lebanese armed forces need to maintain their rightful place as the sole provider of security and stability to the Lebanese people. But critics say the U.S. strategy is failing some point to the Lebanese Prime Minister's official visit to Washington last month. Lebanon is on the front lines in the fight against ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and Hezbollah. U.S. President Donald Trump faced backlash for seeming to misunderstand basic Lebanese politics. Lebanon is on the front line against Daesh and Al-Qaeda-linked groups in Syria, but Hezbollah is a member of Lebanon's democratically elected government. And many say the Iranian-backed militants have infiltrated the army. The Lebanese army recently made significant gains against Daesh in its desert border with Syria, with U.S. special forces fighting alongside. It follows less than a week after Hezbollah pushed out an al-Qaeda-linked militant group from Lebanon and increased its standing as a legitimate defense force in the country. But it has also raised questions about the U.S.'s long-term strategy in Lebanon and what exactly it hopes to accomplish by empowering a regional ally that many say is infiltrated by an adversary. Basil Rahan, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me now is Kamal Wazne. He's the founder of the Center for American Strategic Studies in Beirut. And Matthew Brodsky, a senior fellow at the Security Studies Group in Washington, D.C. Thank you both for joining us. Uh, Matthew, if I could start with you, what makes you think that American weapons being supplied to Lebanon's legitimate army will find their way into Hezbollah's hands? Well, first of all, they're fighting together. Uh, the two organizations are closely coordinating operations together. 
Uh, we've seen during the Martyrs' Day uh, military parade that Hezbollah hosted in Kosar that uh, they were, you know, showing the their American-made weapons there before. So uh, we know that, that there's coordination and cooperation on many levels, and not to mention a, uh, the time in April where the uh, LAF actually chaperoned Hezbollah to the border region with Israel um, in flouting the UN resolution that ended the 2006 war between Israel and Hezbollah. Uh, they're working together, coordinating together, and the U.S. is unfortunately uh, allowing this to happen. Uh, Kamal Wazne, very simple evidence put forward by Matthew Brodsky in broad daylight, isn't it? Well, obviously, uh, we have the Lebanese army. Uh, the, the Lebanese army are fighting their war against extremists, against terrorists, against Daesh. And we have, on the other side, Hezbollah are fighting also the same terrorist organization, Daesh, and all other terrorist organizations. The fact that Qusayr is on the Syrian side, it's not on the Lebanese side. Uh, so basically, the weapons that uh, the, the army it has, it's, uh, it's, it's their own, it's backed by the United States, supplied by the United States. And the army that, uh, and the uh, ammunition and all other weaponry that uh, the Hezbollah has, it came from the Syrian and the army. So there's basically, there's no shortage on the part of Hezbollah to, to actually uh, get weapon from, from uh, the Lebanese army, nor the Lebanese army volunteer their weapon to anybody else. They're independent. But on, on, on certain level, yes, there is coordination because it's one front. And that's part of the, actually, the platform of the government that it stated very clearly that there is the, 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 the people, the resistance, and, and the army. What they mean the resistance here, they basically still the weapon of Hezbollah. It's nothing that uh, is not clear at this point, but uh, despite all that, the army uh, operate independently and uh, away from every other uh, group in Lebanon. But uh, Kamal, just to pick you up on the, the, the original question, which was that US weapons could find their way via the Lebanese armed forces into Hezbollah's hands. Are you saying that's not going to happen? No, no, that's it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen and never happened before. This is a propaganda is being launched somewhere. It doesn't have any any base or merits. Basically, what's uh, what's basically uh, the the Lebanese the Lebanese army that is supplied by the United States stay with the Lebanese army. The 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 recent uh, uh, confrontation between Hezbollah and Nasra, they found an American uh, army uh, tank. And they actually took it from Al Nasra and gave it back to the Lebanese army. So this is a case where they actually got hold out of a tank M113 from uh, from Al Nusra, and they didn't keep it because they don't need it. In my right. estimate, Hezbollah has enough weapon and ammunition, and everybody can see that in the daylight and uh, during that operation that they have uh, a lot of weapons. Probably uh, the, the Lebanese army don't have that much uh, firepower. Matthew Brodsky, uh, a couple of times off camera, we caught you chuckling there. There we go, thank you. Uh, what exactly do you find so amusing? Well, I mean, he pretty much suggested about a minute ago that the, that the armored personnel carriers that Hezbollah was using in the parade on the Syrian side of the border came from weapons that what? That the United States provided Assad? I don't think so. Look. <laughs> These weapons are clearly given to the LAF. No, this is not, no, this is not what I said. He did not say Assad. I'm sorry. Uh, Kamal Wazni, just I clarify say your that. point. He misunderstood Please. the concept. But, yeah, Kamal Wazni, just clar is, clarify that point. My point is, when they attack... Uh, yes, when Al-Nasra attacked the Lebanese army a while ago, they actually took some of these armament and took it with them. When Hezbollah fought Al-Nasra and defeated Al-Nasra, he actually sees that... Uh, uh, that M113 and gave it back to the army. That's what I said. Matthew? That's different from your okay. story. Right. The fact is from the LAF, if, if he's going to claim, which is likely true, that the LAF is staying within Lebanon, while Hezbollah has obviously been all over Syria since 2013, the fact is LAF is uh, protecting Hezbollah's flank. 
And that's what it's doing in, in Lebanon, and that's what allows Hezbollah uh, its room to maneuver in Syria. Now, the United States from 2009 arrested a number of Hezbollah operatives here in the country, in the U.S., that were looking to purchase <clears throat> M4 uh, carbine rifles and looking to buy M200 sniper rifles and radio equipment. Now, the U.S. has basically fulfilled this shopping list for Hezbollah by giving it to the Lebanese Armed Forces. Now, again, when the Lebanese Armed Forces chaperoned Hezbollah to the border with Israel in April with a, quote, environmental NGO, which is no such thing, and set up observation points and took pictures with shoulder-launched missiles that Hezbollah had, it's pretty obvious that there's coordination and cooperation going on there. In much the same way, you can go on Twitter today and find from reputable journalists who have posted pictures of the uh, close contact between Hezbollah and the LAF. Not to mention, obviously, they're coordinating, even if you didn't have pictures and all the evidence, because <laughs> they would be caught in a crossfire if they weren't. The two have been helping each other with IED explosions in the past day or two. They're working together. It's, Kamal, it's strange to pretend in Beirut, otherwise. let's just go to you for a moment. What is your take on that? Well, he has to understand Lebanese politics, first of all. Obviously, we have a government headed by a prime minister and headed by a president. In that cabinet, there is a member of Hezbollah in that cabinet. So there is no disagreement whether there is coordination or there is not a coordination. And the fact that Hezbollah is on the borderline, uh, defending the border against Israel, there is a Lebanese army on the, on the border, that's, a, that's, that's something is not, Lebanon is shy away from it. But the fact, your, your main point, whether the weapon that is provided by the United States is going to Hezbollah, that's a different story. But as far as coordination, obviously there is a coordination in, 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 in Lebanon uh, between the Lebanese army as, uh, as part as at least because those people, those ministers, those members of the parliament of Hezbollah, they are in the parliament, they are in the government. Yes, uh, they are part of the decision making. So don't be surprised if there is a coordination. Hezbollah is not what President Trump stated, that, that the Lebanese government is fighting Daesh yes. and Hezbollah. That's, that's, that's a stupid statement came from somebody who doesn't understand let the me politics bring in of Lebanon Math and the Middle East. Let me bring in Matthew Brodsky. He's in Washington. Surely that was an enormous foreign policy faux pas for Donald Trump to say that Lebanon was on the front line with terrorists such as Daesh and Hezbollah. Clearly, absolutely. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, President Trump doesn't understand the nuances of Lebanese politics or the Middle East. I'll grant you that one. Um, in speaking to a senior White House official recently, they seem to view the LAF as uh, existing on an ideological spectrum and that the U.S. can choose which units that uh, it can give to. So not all of them are, in fact, loyal to uh, Hezbollah. Uh, in their view, uh, this one went on to tell me, is that if uh, the Lebanese state should fall or, Hebani or uh, Hezbollah should crumble at some point, it's better that the U.S. has someone to talk to. Um, stepping back from that, I would say I'm glad to that your guest and I essentially agree. I'm not saying that the U.S. is giving weapons to Hezbollah. They're giving them to the LAF, but they're coordinating and that's what he's confirming. But of course, so I, I think we basically agree on that. And what he's saying is that Hezbollah is in the parliament, which I grant you that. It's, that's why the United States needs yeah. to update and review its policy. Uh, and it's not just our guest, of course. The president of Lebanon, Michel Aoun, has been talking. And uh, here's what he said about Hezbollah's need for weapons. As long as there is an occupied land by Israel and since the Lebanese army is not strong enough to fight Israel and stand in their face, then yes, of course, we feel the need to their presence. And it is complementary to the Lebanese army and it does not contradict it. Hence, there is no resistance in our inner life. And only if you knew who Hezbollah is, Hezbollah are the southern residents. They are the residents of this land and they protect their land when they are being sweeped by Israel. Kamal Wasney, it's interesting. I mean, from 
our viewers' perspective, they, they may be wondering, who is the real army of Lebanon? Which force is really the most important and in charge? Which one would you say it is? No, no. Basically, the, the, the main army of, the, of Lebanon is the Lebanese army. But the resistance actually exists side by side by the army to defend the, the country. And the fact that uh, the, the, the land that was occupied by Israel was liberated by the resistance, that's, that's, nobody can deny it. And that's uh, what the president of, of the country stated, uh, basically, that Hezbollah is side by side to defend the country against any Israeli aggression. The fact that somebody wanted to de deny the threat that exists from the Israeli, nobody talk about that the American give uh, hundreds of billions of dollars to the, to, to the Israeli, and those Israeli always have incursion against Lebanese sovereignty. So when you stop supplying weapons to the Israeli, then we can consider uh, breaking down the resistance. Kamal, the has Hezbollah infiltrated the, 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 the Lebanese United States army? hasn't looked fairly on the politics of the Middle East. Would you say Hezbollah has managed to infiltrate and influence the Lebanese army? No, he does, Hezbollah does not need to infiltrate or uh, influence the, uh, the, the army. The, the army of Lebanon, actually, their, their, their position, their, their ideology is basically defending the territory of Lebanon. As long as the, the ter territory of Lebanon is not being jeopardized by any uh, external threat, then there is no problem. Once that uh, threat will come, then you're going to find what the mandate uh, of the con basically what we call semi agreement between the political party as part of an agreement that the people the resistance and the army will be fighting side by side against any aggression here if you look at the threat that came from daesh daesh was a threat against lebanon against the the the, the arab world against the world the one who put the most a fight against Daesh is you have to like it or do not like it is basically uh, Hezbollah and the one who funded Daesh is basically uh, basically people from the Obama administration at least that's what your president stated Matthew Brodsky well yeah first of all he's talking about fairness in the United States supplying Israel and him supplying and Hezbollah uh, maintaining their weapons Let's remember there the UN Security Council Resolution 1701, which ended the 2006 war between Hezbollah and Israel, called for Hezbollah to disarm and for them not to be uh, smuggling weapons in. Now, he is correct. The Obama administration pursued a policy that was to boost Iran in the entire region at the expense of America's traditional allies. So I'll grant you that. But what we have is uh, the Trump administration, unfortunately, expanding that exact formulation right now. And so 1701, the resolution which was supposed to have the LAF have sovereignty over the entire country and Hezbollah disarm, Obama decided he was going to concentrate only on Sunni insurgents from Syria. So what this means now is in the future, the way that resolution will be interpreted, and here's exactly what Hezbollah is going to do in the future, since Israel withdrew from Lebanon in 2000, they don't occupy any land there. There's no rationale for Hezbollah to keep its weapons. This is, by the way, why they denied that they were even in Syria for the first few years of the civil war there. Now, they are, of course, claiming it, and that's fine. But going forward, what they're going to say is that uh, they need to keep their weapons to fight the Sunni insurgents. That will be their new uh, line, and uh, hopefully the West won't buy it. Hopefully the Trump administration will correct Obama's bad policy. Uh, final word from you, Kamal Wazne. Do you think uh, the Trump administration will correct anything? I think that the Trump administration is not capable of understanding what is taking place in the Middle East. The, the weapon of the resistance will be there defending the country. That's not for aggression. That's for defense deterrence. And the fight is not against the Sunnah or anything like he labeled it. It's against Daesh and terrorism. And everybody in agreement throughout the world that Daesh is a terrorist organization. We must be all fighting that. And if you don't understand that concept, please, you have to reread the politics of the Middle East. And we can do that. Kamal Wozni in Beirut and Matthew Brodsky in Washington, D.C. Thank you very much, both of you, for your contribution to the Newsmakers.
refugees continue to arrive in their hundreds, uh, and that may increase once the rainy season subsides. Um, we continue to operate in a situation where we're chronically and severely underfunded. So far this year, the humanitarian response has received just 21% of the 674 million US dollars needed to provide all the needs to the South Sudanese refugees in Uganda in 2017. Well, joining me now from Geneva is Babo Baloch. He's UNHCR's senior spokesman for East Africa, the Horn of Africa and the Great Lakes. Mm -hmm. Babo, thank you very much for joining us on The Newsmakers. Uh, we're lucky to have you because you've actually just come back from South Sudan. Ethiopia and Sudan. Uh, tell us about the situation in South Sudan. Why are people leaving in such great numbers? It's quite a desperate uh, situation inside uh, South Sudan. Uh, since uh, July 2016, uh, with renewed violence and more attacks on civilians, many of South Sudanese have been on the move. Uh, I went to Juba, uh, South Sudan's capital, uh, where we met with the internally displaced people uh, who were taking refuge in a UN uh, camp that was protected by the UN. I went outside of uh, Juba, met uh, internally displaced people over there. They're quite uh, tired of all this happening for too long over there. When you talk uh, uh, to them, try to find out, it, everyone is trying to run for their lives inside South Sudan as well. So we have uh, around 2 million South Sudanese that have been internally displaced because of all these happening inside the countries. And as well, we have 2 million uh, South Sudanese who have been forced to take refuge in the neighboring countries. Now, these people are civilians. They're not combatants. Why do they have to move out of their homes? Exactly. Uh, what we have seen is that civilians have come under attack uh, because the, of their ethnicity, uh, I mean, uh, armed groups uh, in the country, uh, different factions fighting over there. But quite often, civilians have been the target of uh, this ongoing and recurring violence inside South Sudan. And it doesn't seem to, uh, there doesn't seem to be an ending to all this tragedy uh, today. There doesn't seem to be a serious effort to bring the warring parties on the table for a dialogue so that South Sudan's civilians, its people, can have a chance to live in peace. What do you think could change that? And if you, you know, could be so bold as to tell me, who do you blame for that? I think we need to put uh, pressure on all sides. International community has to come forward. But isn't that the United Nations job? Some sense of. Uh, I think it's all sides have to step forward. We as humanitarians, uh, not uh, having a role in the politics, we are dealing with the consequences which is falling on the people of South Sudan. So what we are trying to urge, we need to see a sense of urgency in a peace initiative so South Sudan civilians, its people, get a chance to live in peace. So once the um, South Sudanese have made it to Uganda, they're received quite well. Your colleagues uh, in Uganda have been reporting on the situation there. What have they said? Exactly. Uh, South Su uh, Sudanese who have been arriving in Uganda, uh, they have been received quite well with a lot of generosity. Uh, so you don't find uh, refugees in Uganda being in camps. They end up in settlements where we help them uh, building shelter, providing basic services with the government. But also Uganda has a progressive refugee policy, which means they don't want refugees uh, to rely uh, only on aid, but, but they have access to all the basic services. Host communities are sharing land with them. Every refugees receive a piece of land to cultivate and farm uh, things. So it's all uh, to help them 
make a sustainable living in Uganda. But the problem has been now Uganda is hosting over 1 million South Sudanese refugees. Uh, Uganda is doing what it could do on its own part. International support is falling short, by which I mean uh, that the money we need uh, for refugees in Uganda, that's not there. We are struggling do you have UNHCR and other humanitarian organizations? Baba, I'm sorry to ask, but do you have the facts and figures to hand to tell me which countries, which regions are really failing to pull their weight here? I think if we broadly uh, look at uh, the numbers in terms of funding, we are short of 80% of funds for Uganda at least, uh, where we need over $600 million. And let's not forget, this is August. We already uh, have been through eight months of the year. So it is putting a lot of pressure on the host but who are you chasing Uganda, for the money, Baba? This is what we need to know. We need to know who are you chasing for the money? Who are you expecting money to come from? All the donors, which all donors? the donor what, what, countries, which countries who could step forward and, and give 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 us money. I mean, everyone who has, Look, have, and even not all the donors. You have twenty one percent of the money needed. Individuals, where does the money come from, and where is the money not coming from? We need to know this. It's, it's a transparent issue. It is indeed, indeed it is, and and for the twenty percent that have come, those who have been giving it to us, we are thankful. But we need much more to have in our hand. For each five dollar that we need to help these refugees, currently we have just one to spend. Where is the money coming from, and where is it not coming from? I think the money is coming from our individual donors uh, or, or, uh, or the donors that usually are in the international community who give us money, but it's not enough. We need can to you, can see Can you tell us who they more. are? See, it is an international responsibility. Uh, it's, it's not a time to name, uh, but our urge are, are or we our focus about countries, is for, Baba? for countries uh, we, exactly, we're talking about countries, we are talking about regional blocks, financial institutions, individuals, and corporate uh, uh, corporations as well. So it is a global responsibility, and Uganda should not be left to handle it alone. Hmm. Is Uganda in danger of running out of money to help its neighbours? After all, it's not the richest country in the world. Indeed not. I mean, the communities that are hosting refugees, like globally, are one of the most poorest communities. They even themselves don't have enough. Uh, so it, 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 it's quite urgent uh, that more money or resources are at hand to help Uganda and, and then help refugees. It's, it has put uh, Uganda under immense pressure. Uh, there are more and more children in small uh, classrooms. Uh, health uh, services are under immense pressure. Food ration, the basic services that we could provide, everything is at a tipping point here. Baba Baloch in Geneva. Thank you so much for joining us on The Newsmakers. I'm <laughs> عشان هيك نحن طلعنا لهون على تركيا لأنه هم كافي كتير حربوا وكانوا وهي لما يضربوا البرميل تكسروا كل بيتنا تكسروا ما عاد إلنا مطرح مع وطن إلنا سنة ونصومة إلي أربعة أيام بالمدرسة بس 
بحب الرياضيات وعربي وعلوم بعد وقتي بنزل على الحارة بلعب بالمسكليت بعدين بلعب مع اخواتي من كرة الالعاب ونلعب انا بدي احب سي هي مدير Well, it's been exactly four years since that chemical attack Sidra described hit eastern Ghouta. And since then, the regime has continued to carry out chemical attacks, the most recent being in April in Idlib province. Well, that is all for this edition of The Newsmakers with me, Matthew Moore. Next time, Hong Kong's democracy activists become political prisoners. Have the city's courts caved to pressure from Beijing? Thanks for watching. Goodbye.